Good evening. Hello. Everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. That was uh, really, really wonderful and a lot of fun. And yeah, I just got everyone in a sing along mood, and I'm going to bring it down. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, and I just want to thank Debbie so much for your hard work in putting tonight together. <laughs> and of course to Artist Exchange, who uh, Debbie was explaining to me, is just a really cool uh, place where artists can come and, and do work here and sell their work as well. And yeah, so we thank them for having us. But I came the furthest. <laughs> Not really, I was in love with Massachusetts. <laughs> Pleasure to be here with you tonight. I'm touring. This is my ninth trip over from Australia in the last two years, and it's uh, it's been so much fun getting to travel around and share my music and make new friends. And, uh, the the main album that I've been promoting on these tours has been an atheist album. I was brought up in a Jewish family in Melbourne, Australia. I actually learnt to sing in a Jewish wedding band, <laughs> in my father's Jewish wedding band. And uh, I, I never expected to be doing this. <laughs> um, lots of habanigulas. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I guess I had a change of worldview. I used to believe in the Old Testament and Judaism and when I was about probably the ages of 16 to 19 I started to question things and I became an atheist and a secularist and I started to get involved in secular activism. But I've been a songwriter for a lot longer than that. I've been writing songs since I was 11 and so uh, being a songwriter, you write about what's happening to you, these significant experiences, and suddenly, you know, this big change in my life was so significant that I started to write about it. And a lot of what was going on around me, my activism and my conversations with people and stories that um, other people would tell me really in inspired me. And the first song I'd like to share with you tonight stemmed out of one of those discussions. And I'm pretty sure you may have experienced a discussion like this. So when somebody finds out that you're an atheist uh, and they say, well, how do you know how to be a good person without God? And how do you know the difference between what's right and what's wrong without a guidebook to tell you? Uh, so this is my answer to that question of how I know, how I think we all know uh, what's right and what's wrong. This is called My Morality. Deity, it's developed from 
empathy, dependence and love. My morality accepts everybody's sexuality is more concerned with inequality and validation from above. Set into stone tablets Who don't even tell you That it's worthwhile to be good For being good's own sake That not to think for yourself Can be a deadly It's not one of mine, but it's one of my favorite songs to play. I just, I love the lyrics. It's everything that I, I think is wonderful about music. It's inspiring. It's motivating. It's a Phil Oak song called When I'm Gone. There's no place in this world where I belong when I'm gone. Oh, 
I heard that song, I knew I had to play it, and I learned it, and I was so excited. And I thought, the next time I do a show, I'm going to play it straight away. And I uh, do a lot of volunteering uh, music with my father at home. We play at old folks' homes. And uh, <laughs> I didn't think. <laughs> and I just started playing the song, and then I realized it's probably not the best place <laughs> for it. And I cut a couple of verses out just to... <laughs> Probably the only time that song has not been as beautiful. <laughs> um, so, uh, I'm going to play a couple of songs from my atheist album. And this one came out of a, a great discussion with an old friend of mine. Uh, we, we grew up together in the Jewish community in Melbourne, and uh, he doesn't believe in evolution. But it's, it's not from a a place of ignorance or misunderstanding, he very much understands uh, the mechanism of evolution and how it works. And I know this because he won an essay writing competition on evolution when we were in high school, and he was invited to the most prestigious university in our state to give a talk about evolution, which he doesn't believe in. <laughs> um, I'd like to know how he does such amazing mental gymnastics. Anyways, <laughs> so uh, we were having this conversation, and I said, you know, you understand how it works, you understand the mechanism, can't you just look at the evidence and see that it's there and that that's the case? And uh, he answered me amazingly, and this is a bad South African accent. He said, uh, I don't want to look at the evidence, Shelley. I already suspect my life is meaningless and I don't want it to be confirmed. Which <laughs> is like the most fantastic line ever. <laughs> and uh, so I wrote this song for him, and it's about somebody who's holding on to a belief, not for its truth value, but rather for the way that it makes them feel and the comfort that it brings. So this is called House With No Walls.
situation that I have to face it and that that gives me strength and uh, I think a lot of people feel the same way so uh, this is called I don't believe in fairies I don't believe in heaven 
So when I Judaism I was brought up at home with was uh, hypocritical Judaism. <laughs> so <laughs> um, we had like our lifestyle at home, which was not particularly observant. It would probably align with maybe a reform or liberal Judaism over here. Um, but my family didn't want to call themselves uh, liberal or reform. They just they're just Jewish, and we went to an Orthodox synagogue. Uh, which eventually my father became the president of the Orthodox synagogue in our city, and he still is, but he would drive there and park around the corner. Because, <laughs> like, you know, who's going to see him? <laughs> um, and uh, the synagogue that we went to was really strict, so if, if they, have, they have gender segregation, the women will sit upstairs and if you can't make it up the stairs for some reason, you sit at the back with a curtain in front of you. And uh, you're not allowed to participate in leading the service. You're not allowed to read from the Old Testament, which is uh, what the whole service is revolving around. And you're actually not allowed to sing unaccompanied. Uh, a Orthodox Jewish man is not allowed to hear a woman's voice because it's too arousing. Which is true, <laughs> but <laughs> that should mean, I mean, he should just have to leave, maybe. Uh, and uh, so there was shul, Juda synagogue Judaism, home Judaism, and then there was uh, Judaism at school. So I went to a, a private Jewish school, which was also kind of reform. But despite being even a liberal Jewish, Jewish school, we had these really strange things I remember even in primary school, which for us is like from age 6 to 11, you would have, at one, at one point, the prayer in the morning started to become gender segregated, even in primary school. And I distinctly remember this one prayer that we said uh, every morning, and uh, it was a call and response, so the boys would say something and the girls would follow up afterwards, and the, the boys would say in Hebrew, uh, Dear God, thank you for not making me a woman. And then the girls would answer, Dear God, thank you for making me what I am. And uh, you're not allowed to touch each other. Uh, the rabbi, who is a close friend of our family, will come over and you know, shake my dad's hand, and shake my brother's hand, and then, hello, Shelly. Uh, sometimes, I had one rabbi friend who used to do air high fives. <laughs> um, and these these are the experiences that tell you what it, what it is to be a woman. And these are the experiences that shape my identity as, as a young woman in Judaism. And uh, this song is a reflection of those experiences. It's called Eve. Everything that I can, I must 
surrender to his will, yeah, I must submit. I can't make the household decision, cause I am on feet. He tells me my place. Be silent, you can't hear my voice. My role has been divinely defined, and I have no other choice. I may not be a teacher of men, I must cover up my shame. These are the laws of the one who, in vain, I cannot name. He tells me my place. to head over and he started laughing and drove away and you know it's one thing to not pick up a hitchhiker I understand that I'm terrifying looking you know? <laughs> no but it could be dangerous so I understand that that's cool but to go out of your way to you know put somebody down during their day is just um, incomprehensible to me and I started to think about how people can be so unkind to each other and how you know maybe if you don't look the same or you're not coming from the same place then that person's not going to help you and so I started writing this song about how everybody is awful to each other and while I was writing this song uh, another gentleman walked past and I think he thought I was busking or something because he gave me a whole pile of money <laughs> <laughs> 
So I couldn't keep writing this song about how everybody is awful <laughs> <laughs> to strangers uh, when I'd just been given such a lovely and generous gift. So the song changed into this big cheesy love song to everybody on the planet and I stand by it. And, uh, it's called Hitchhiking Song. Tracy Chapman, um, and so we, we wrote this record together called Little March, and I'd like to play um, a couple of songs from that. This first one is a happy love song 
from my partner back in Australia. It's called My Word.
Um, it's really specifically focused on this ritual, but uh, growing up in a, in a Jewish family that is very focused on ritual and, and, and the power of shared experience, um, I guess it's a, a meditation on, on that as a whole. And um, it has such a transformative power and I think most of us have that capacity to feel that power of shared experience, um, whether it be a focus on the present or a connection to the past or even a connection to the future. It's something that can give a deep meaning. And I think we all understand that and in some way religions have hijacked that and it almost becomes something we don't think about anymore, you know. I do this because this is what my father did and his mother did and her father did and you know, there's no reason other than perpetuating it for perpetuating its sake. But I think if we can, you know, harness that transformative power that is inherent in shared experience that we can use it for something really positive, like a book club. <laughs> or going out every weekend to support live music. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> so, um, so this is about the festival, which is called uh, in Romanian the Marti Shore, which translates directly into Little March. From 
probably my most peaceful song to my most angry song. Uh, this is a single from my album, an atheist album. I, I wrote it after I had a discussion in the street with a preacher. He told me that I was going to hell and that I was going to burn forever, very nicely. <laughs> um, and I, I went home and I was so angry because no, I, I understand that he really believed that and he was actually spending his day trying to help people in his own mind. Um, but it, it's still not fair, it's not okay to come into my world and my space and tell me how to live my life and tell me what I should do to behave correctly and enforce your morality, your sexual hang-ups, all of that on me. And uh, so I, I wrote this song very quickly in a quiet rage. <laughs> it's called Save.
Oh, it's nearly my, I think time is nearly up, but um, how's everyone feeling? Do you have uh, time for another one or two? Or yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. yeah. Um, what about a, a funny song? Well, I guess I can't say it's funny, you have to decide that. <laughs> um, well, a less serious song, I guess. Uh, but it's a true story and it's very heartbreaking. I, uh, I was working at the marketplace selling socks and uh, I, I was next to a, a live fish stall where they were selling these fish as pets and they had um, Mexican walking fish like salamanders, do you know them, or axolotls or, they were like eels, little eels with little arms and legs <laughs> and I like them because I imagine that that's Kind of what our ancestors would have looked like. <laughs> and so uh, I was pretty lonely and miserable because just that past week I had been dumped and uh, was yeah, really heartbroken. And I thought, oh, I'm going to get myself a salamander and I'm going to have a new friend and it's going to be great. So I bought, I spent more than the money I made that day at the market and I bought the tank and the rocks and the plastic castle and the net and the worms and the filter and <laughs> everything. And, I, I brought him home, I was living with my family at the time, and I said, quick, mom, dad, Josh, bro, come and have a look what I got. And they came around and we opened up the bag, and he was dead. Uh, so I wrote this very heartfelt song about uh, my dead salamander and my ex-boyfriend. <laughs> and uh, it's completely true, and kind of uh, am rated, but I apologize. <laughs> So, this is called The Salamander Song. I dreamed of you last night And then my salamander died I wish that you had died instead start to forget and I would have had a pretty cool pet but now my salamander is dead
had all the stuff, so I thought I might as well get another one. And then he got a flesh-eating virus, and I had to go and buy all this medication, like nurse him to health, and he still died, slowly disintegrating in front of me and my tank. So I gave up. Um, or I wrote another song, though, that's, that would be a bit more graphic. Um, <laughs> Um, cool. So this is going to be my last song, and I just want to say thank you so much for being such an amazing audience. It's been really enjoyable to uh, share with you tonight. And um, yeah, thank you so much to Jacob. It was really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Very, very entertaining. And again to Debbie and Voices United. Um, this song is probably my favorite one of mine to play, which is why I usually leave it till the end. Uh, and it was inspired by uh, someone who influenced me a great deal, especially when I was going through this change of worldview. Um, and it, it's dedicated and inspired by uh, Christopher Hitchens. Uh, he, I, I took some of the, the ideas that I heard from him that really moved me and, and tried to put it into this song. And the song is kind of about finding meaning in an inherently meaningless life and finding purpose in an inherently purposeless life. And a contrast of our cosmic insignificance. We are small, tiny, we have no universal reach. The universe doesn't care for us. It's not going to help us. We're going to smash into the closest galaxy or the galaxy that's heading towards us. And uh, contrast that insignificance with our real life earthly significance because the way that we treat each other and the way that we speak to each other and even just the way that we think about things in our mind has a real tangible impact here and now with each other and that is the only meaning that really matters. Um, so this is called Apocalyptic Love Song for Hitchens. One day the sun is going to die For us it means no more sunsets To the universe just one less star in the sky And almost all who ever lived Have already died Count the stories of love and war And hope and pain Now side of way, side by side Yes, I understand that my whole life is just a blink of an eye The history of the earth is when each moment that goes by But this moment that I'm with you It feels like time has stood still It feels somehow like it matters But it always will In one billion years Oceans will dry while somehow life may continue. There will not be known to you and I to think we are so important is an obvious crime. We know that we are specks on a tiny dot.